This is Dr. Christopher Cernike hosting episode 19 of season 6 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. Today, we will be speaking with Dr. Casey Luskin about surprising new research on junk DNA and his most recent debate on the subject. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Casey Luskin. Dr. Luskin has a Bachelor and Master of Science degree in Earth Sciences from the University of California, San Diego, where he studied evolution extensively at the graduate and undergraduate levels and conducted geological research at the Scripps Institute for Oceanography. Dr. Luskin also has a Ph.D. in geology from the University of Johannesburg, where he specialized in paleomagnetism and the early plate tectonic history of South Africa. Dr. Luskin is also a Juris Doctor, having obtained his law degree from the University of San Diego and has served as a California licensed attorney since 2005. Practicing primarily in the area of evolution education in public schools, and defending academic freedom for scientists who face discrimination because they support intelligent design. Dr. Luskin is published in science journals and technical law journals such as Geochemistry, Geophysics and Geosystems, South Africa Journal of Geology, Montana Law Review, the Journal of Church and State, the University of St. Thomas Journal of Law and Public Policy, and he's a regular contributor Evolution News and the ID the Future podcast. And Dr. Luskin is the co founder of the Intelligent Design and Evolution Awareness or IDEA Center and is the assistant director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. And now, without further ado, good afternoon, Dr. Luskin. How was your day and how are you doing? Thanks for, so much for letting me join you, Christopher. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you for coming back on Current Topics in Science. And since this is Current Topics in Science, let's take a look at this week's current topic. We're going to be looking at two articles today, one of which is called The Gene Deserts Unraveling the Mysteries of Disease. The headline reads, Mutations in these regions of so-called junk DNA are increasingly being linked to a range of diseases, from Crohn's to cancer. The article pointed out that so-called junk DNA is turning out to have essential regulatory functions, impacting gene expressions and disease development. What the Crick scientists found was that CHR21Q22 contains an enhancer, a segment of DNA which can regulate nearby or distant genes capable of cranking up the amount of proteins they make. Lee refers to this behavior as a volume dial. Delving deeper, they found that this enhancer is only active in white blood cells called macrophages, where it can ramp up the activity of a previously little-known gene called ETS2. The scientists believe that malfunctions in this gene are what is causing inflammation. David Cox, the article's author, wrote, While macrophages play a vital role in clearing dead cells or fighting off harmful microorganisms, when the body produces too many, they can wreak havoc in inflammatory or autoimmune diseases. Another article by Nina Massini reports that DNA sequences originating from ancient infections are found in the brain, with some contributing to susceptibility for conditions like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression, a study found. Researchers looked at data from large studies involving tens of thousands of people, both with and without mental health conditions, as well as information from autopsy brain samples from 800 people. They found that some genes preferentially affected the expression 
of HERVs. Dr. Luskin, can you comment on the latest research claiming that junk DNA plays a role in both physical and mental illness? These are very interesting uh, stories and studies that you've uncovered, Christopher. In fact, you sent these to me and had me read them in preparation for this interview, and they're great studies. What they show is that basically the quote-unquote junk DNA, the DNA in our genomes that does not code for proteins, is actually very important for performing various biological functions. And just sort of to frame the issue here, for many decades it was thought that the vast majority of our genomes, say 98% plus, was what we call junk DNA. Basically, it was protein, it was DNA that, that did not encode for proteins. And the assumption from an evolutionary point of view was that that DNA was basically useless. It was not doing anything to help our bodies. It was just sitting there, the result of sort of evolutionary debris that accumulated over eons of time through random mutations. And it has been argued that this junk DNA was evidence against intelligent design because no designer would fill up our genomes with all this useless genetic junk, right? So I've been around this debate for about 25 or so years. And since the earliest days that I was involved in the late 90s, early 2000s, people have been using this junk DNA argument as an argument against intelligent design. And they were using this argument before I got involved with it as well. But it's a very common, popular argument that people have tried to make against intelligent design. Now, it's important to understand that back in those days when I first got involved with this, say the late 90s, early 2000s, we had barely studied the genome at that point. At that point, we had no idea what this quote unquote dark matter, junk DNA of the dark matter of the genome was doing. We didn't know. And so we would always say, well, it's premature for us to assume that just because we don't know what it's doing, that therefore it isn't doing anything and it's junk. Let's wait and see. Let's actually take the time to do the research and see if it actually is in fact junk. And so intelligent design theorists, going back to those days, you know, the mid 1990s, late 90s, early 2000s, had been predicting that this junk DNA would turn out to have important functions. And we made these predictions long before the evidence of function was discovered. So these two studies that you have uh, provided for us today, Christopher, are just two of literally thousands and thousands of examples of studies that have found function for junk DNA. The first one that you mentioned that found that the, there's basically a particular mutations in the, this area of, of one genome or one chromosome, it's called a gene desert, meaning that's an area of the genome where there are not protein coding genes, okay? This is exactly the kind of section of the genome that used to be considered junk DNA. What they found is that there are particular mutations in this quote unquote gene desert that are actually very closely associated with disease. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that these regions of the genome are in fact functional. Normally, they're doing their jobs. You don't think about them because they're doing their jobs, they're working just fine, and they're, you know, they're basically doing what they're supposed to do. But when you get a mutation, something goes wrong, they aren't doing their jobs properly, and in fact, you know, you start to get some kind of disease. In these cases, it talked about inflammatory bowel disease, some cancers that are associated with these regions, a lot of issues having to do like with the gut, okay? And so clearly these are regular, these have some kind of an important function related to the gut. And it turns out that these, uh, the, the region where this mutation occurs is involved in regulating protein coding genes. And this is actually a very, very common function for the junk DNA. They may not be encoding proteins, but they're regulating the DNA that does encode the proteins. It's called regulating gene expression. And this is probably the most common kind of function that has been, there have been many functions discovered for junk DNA, but this is probably one of the most common functions for the quote unquote junk DNA, is that although they don't encode proteins, they are regulating the genes that do encode proteins. And when we say regulate, what do we mean by that? It's basically helping to decide where and when the, uh, the protein coding genes are being expressed. So where and when you will make particular proteins, how much protein you're going to make, when you're going to stop making the protein, uh, in what in response to what environmental cues are you, go you going to make these proteins, basically involved in determining when and where and how much of the proteins are being produced. So I like to give this analogy, Christopher, that if you think of building a house, okay, um, building a house surprisingly only requires a certain basic number of parts. 
I mean, it's more than this, but you need wood, you need brick, you need nails, you need mortar, and you need a lot of other things. I mean, you need wires, you need different kinds of nails, et cetera, et cetera. But building a house only takes a certain set number of parts. But if you just have a bunch of brick and wood and nails and mortar and so forth laying around, is that going to get you a house? No, you need a blueprint, okay? You need an actually to know where do you put the bricks? Where do you put the wood? Where do you use the nails? Where do you use the mortar? How much do you use at what places, what times? If you don't have that blueprint to follow, you're not gonna be able to build and construct a house. So in many respects, I would say that our genome works kind of like that. The protein coding DNA that encodes the actual proteins, that's kind of like the DNA that is encoding the actual physical materials that build up your body, okay? Kind of like the bricks and the wood, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you also need a blueprint to tell you where to produce those parts, when to produce them, how much to produce, um, and when to stop producing them, et cetera. That blueprint is often contained in the non-coding DNA or the junk DNA. So the non-coding or junk DNA is, is highly important, extremely important for building an organism's body plan. In fact, I mean, certainly without it, you would not be able to be alive. The junk DNA is vital. It may not be building the actual physical body parts, but it controls the blueprint that tells you what went where in many respects, where to put those parts. Okay. So what's going on here is it looks like this mutation in this non-coding region of DNA, it's called CHR21 Q22, that it is actually involved in regulating the expression of some particular genes. Okay. So basically, again, very, very standard function for junk DNA. And the gene that they think it is uh, regulating is called MYC or MYC. And it's believed that this is why when this gene is not being regulated properly because of the function or the mutation in this junk DNA region that you get these diseases. Okay. So that's a pretty simple story, but it's a great example that you came up with of how junk DNA can function. Now, the other study you came up with is also very interesting because this is thought to be a mutation in something that is called a human endogenous retrovirus, okay? So what is a human endogenous retrovirus? These are thought to be, I mean, if you if you sort of take the standard evolutionary view at, at face value, what they will tell you is that endogenous retroviruses or ERVs are ancient, basically viral infections where there was a virus that infected one of your, you know, very deep ancestors' bodies. And then that virus, because it was a, a, a retrovirus, it was able to do something called retrotransposition. It act, could actually insert its own DNA or RNA, basically its DNA back into your genome, okay? And then when it infected the germline, germline of one of your ancestors, that DNA then got copied into the sperm or egg of your ancestor, which then, you know, of course, allowed it to be passed on to future generations, okay? So these sort of are thought to be ancient remnants of virus infections very, very deep in your ancestry. Now, this, of course, means that it is useless. It is not there on purpose. It is there because some random virus and, you know, infected one of your ancestors and just put this junk DNA into your, your, your genome and, and it does nothing for you. It is now known, very well established, that ERVs can have a myriad of different kinds of functions. Um, and, and they can also be involved in regulating gene expression. Okay, we're going to come back to that later because I think we're going to come back to ERVs. But ERVs can certainly be involved in regulating gene expression, and they actually are known to be involved in regulating gene expression in the brain. So you can't tell me that's not an important function when ERVs are actually regulating gene expression in the human brain, and probably the brains of many other species as well. So in this case, there is a mutation in a particular uh, ERV. By the way, according to this paper, and this is correct, ERVs make up about 8% of the human genome. Um, and so it's, they, they're very common in the human genome. Um, but in this case, Mutations in particular ERVs are associated with various mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and also depression. Okay. And so that's very important. You know, obviously, when you don't have, when you're not regulating production of proteins properly in the brains, it can lead to all kinds of problems. And that's probably, probably exactly what is going on here. Again, it's not a very, I mean, the precise details are going to be very complicated, but the basic outline here that junk DNA. It controls the expression of genes. It's regulating gene expression. And when it when you get a mutation in those regions, it causes problems, causes diseases. Could be a physical disease like IBS, or could be a mental disease like schizophrenia. Nonetheless, nonetheless, same issue going on. Mutation in the junk DNA causing disease. 
Very, very easy to understand. And that shows that it's functional. I really appreciated your comments, Dr. Luskin. For this next question, I would appreciate it if you could give our audience a practical foundation to move forward with. I'll start by reading a quotation from Andrew McDermott, who wrote, Despite a paradigm shift in attitudes toward junk DNA, some evolutionary scientists today are still strongly pushing the idea that our genome is largely junk. So since some do still operate under the old paradigm, practically speaking, what is a quick and accessible answer that an ID proponent can give to an evolutionary colleague who challenges them with junk DNA? Yeah, so sort of talking about like an elevator pitch here. What would be your elevator pitch that the genome is in fact largely functional? Here would be my elevator pitch. In 2012, there was a series of papers published out of something called the ENCODE project. The ENCODE project was a consortium, still is a consortium of hundreds of scientists around the world who were studying the non-coding DNA. And what they discovered is that over 80% of our genome is being transcribed into RNA or associated with some kind of biochemical activity. That right there is evidence of biological function. I know of a an ID friendly biologist at a uh, an Ivy League school, and this I don't want to identify this person. I want to protect them. But here's what they told me: they said that the general gist in their field, this person studies RNA, okay, is that if a piece of DNA is being transcribed into RNA, then there's a reason for it. There's a function for it, okay. And we see that over 80% of the genome has this evidence of biochemical activity. Huge percentage, you know, well over that, around that mark is being transcribed in RNA. So that is prima facie evidence of function right there. Now, on top of that, we have seen a slew of papers. When I say slew, I mean many, many thousands of papers that have discovered functions for specific genetic elements that were previously called junk DNA. There was an article in the journal Nature um, in 2021, which found that oh, there have been specific functions identified now for over 130,000 different genetic elements that were once thought to be junk DNA. And it shows the curve of our knowledge of function for junk DNA going up over time. And the curve looks like it has an exponential shape. So in other words, our knowledge of the function of ju for junk DNA is going up at a very fast rate, and it shows no sign of, sign of showing slowing down, okay? There's no signs that our discovery of function for junk DNA is going to slow down. In fact, it's just going to continue to go up, 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 up. So basically, there has been a paradigm shift in mainstream biology away from the idea of junk DNA. In fact, there was a paper in bioessays that came out last year in 2023, which said exactly that. It said that there has been a Kuhnian paradigm shift away from the concept of junk DNA. And what that means is that there has been a huge just change in the way biologists think about this. So if you have an evolutionary colleague or friend who is sort of promoting the idea that our genome is largely junk, here's what I would also say to them. What's interesting is that, look, we can accept right now that the majority of biologists are going to call themselves evolutionists, all right? But the majority of biologists don't work in the specific subfield of biology called evolutionary biology, okay? The majority of biologists are just trying to tease apart how do biological systems operate? How do they function? How do they work? Those biologists who actually study how things work in living organisms, they, by and large, no longer believe in junk DNA, okay? There was an article in the journal Genome Biology and Evolution in 2021 that literally said the days of junk DNA are over. Why are they saying that? Because it's now widely recognized in the biology community that the vast majority of DNA is not, in fact, junk. And the junk is probably going to be the rare exception to the rule, okay? So when you have rank and file biologists who are just studying how biology works, abandoning the idea of junk DNA, they're not doing that because of some ideology for or against evolution. They're doing that just because it's what the data shows, okay? And the data shows that when you look for function, you find function, okay? Um, in fact, going back to ENCODE, over 80% of the genome is functional. You might be wondering, why is it only 80%? Is you know, some 20% of our genome actually junk? The answer to that is no. What ENCODE found is that many genetic elements are only active or functional in very specific cell types 
at very specific stages of the human life cycle. Okay. In fact, one of the studies that you mentioned, Christopher, found just that, that one of these junk DNA elements is active only in certain cell types. I think it was white blood cells or something like that. And so that right there shows you exactly what we're talking about, that many aspects of our genome, they're only active in very specific cell types at very specific stages of the human life cycle, because that's what you want. They have this very specific job. They're like, you know, you go to watch a, a concert and you've got like the, you know, the bell ringer or the triangle player in the orchestra, right? That person who plays a triangle, they may only, you know, ding that triangle once throughout the entire concert, but that's that one time that's important. It's going to, it's going to chime in at just the right moment to play their part. A lot of aspects of the human genome function much, much the same way. Okay. And so what was found at the ENCODE project is that um, because many as many parts of our genomes are only functional in very specific cell types, very specific time periods, you're not going to catch them in action unless you're very lucky. And the ENCODE project only studied about 147 cell types in the human body, whereas we have some, you know, 2,000 or so cell types. So there's still many cell types that they didn't study where other that other 20% of the genome very likely is functional. So the point of this is that there were lead encode researchers who predicted that as we study more and more cell types, that the 80% is actually going to go to 100%, and we're going to find that every single nucleotide in the genome is in fact associated with some kind of a function, okay? So this is probably a pretty long elevator ride. Maybe the elevator got stuck, and so we're having like, you know, a couple minutes to have a conversation. Hopefully not. But, you know, I think that there is pretty good evidence for function being the rule in our genome, not the exception. Uh, whereas the evolutionary biologist, so this is the other point I wanted to make. The biologists who study how, bio, how genomes work, how biology works, they are by and large no longer looking very favorably upon, upon the idea of junk DNA. The only folks who are pushing junk DNA today, I shouldn't say the only, but typically the folks who are pushing junk DNA are gonna be your evolutionary biologists. The folks who have a very vested inference in, or in interest, I should say, in the vast majority of our genome being junk DNA, because you know they know that if it's not largely junk, that's a problem for their evolutionary paradigm, and it's a big win for intelligent design. And so, because of this, Christopher, yeah, I feel like some evolutionary biologists, they're kind of like you know, you remember those soldiers who, 30 years after World War II ended, were still hiding out in caves. And he had to convince them the war was actually over. They're kind of like that. The war on junk, the, war, the, the big debate about whether or not the genome is largely junk, I would say it's over for, for most biologists. But you get these holdouts in the evolutionary community, and they are the ones who are still really wedded to the idea of junk DNA. They're not ready to give up on it yet. And so they're the ones that are really pushing this. So, you know, you will find some folks who certainly promote junk DNA, but I think that that, that viewpoint is going to go by the wayside more and more as, as the years go, go on. I appreciated all of those analogies, Dr. Luskin. And now, building on your explanation, let's delve deeper into the potential significance of the so-called junk DNA. Reflecting on your debate with Dr. Dan, you had said, the vast majority of our genome may only be active in certain cell types in certain parts of the human life cycle. So it's not actually being used most of the time. That doesn't mean it's not important. That doesn't mean it doesn't have an important function in situations where it's activated and being used. Dr. Luskin, can you tell us about the functions of junk DNA? Now, ID did predict that we would find mass functionality for junk DNA long before these th functions were discovered. But some of the various functions for junk DNA include forming higher order nuclear structures, forming centromeres, forming telomeres, binding cohesin to chromosomes. They're involved in cellular stress response, chromatin condensation, brain development, DNA repair. And these are sort of just very generic uh, functions. You want to talk about more specific ones? They're involved in limb formation, fighting viral infections. In fact, ERVs are sometimes involved in that. Um, repetitive DNA controls development in mammals. It's involved in forming body plans, forming fear-related memories and phobias. They have immune and metabolism related functions. They can be, uh, sometimes they're actually translated into proteins. They can regulate gene expression in the human brain and they're involved in cell differentiation, differentiation development. That's basically deciding what kind of a cell type a cell becomes as it is development. But, you know, none of these touch on, well, some of them are connected to it, but the, the most important, most prominent function for junk DNA 
is regulating gene expression. And there are many, many examples of this that have been found, and they're very important for regulating gene expression. So, I mean, we go on and on, but I think, you know, the, the answer is clear. The junk DNA can have a myriad, numerous different functions. Yeah. Thank you for your comment on that, Dr. Luskin. For this question, we're going to look at what is considered to be the best evidence against intelligent design. Dr. Eugenie Scott said, perhaps the best rebuttal to the design argument is the existence of something called pseudogenes. Common ancestry makes biology make sense. So Dr. Luskin, is it the case that pseudogenes have debunked intelligent design? If not, what kind of functions could they have? So, you know, this is a very common rejoinder you get from the evolutionary proponents. And just for the record, Eugenie Scott, who is she? She is the former executive director of the National Center for Science Education, which is an anti-ID advocacy group. Very smart lady, I'm not knocking her intelligence, her qualifications, her credibility, any of that. But you can see that, you know, she's a great example of who is out there promoting junk DNA. It's the evolutionary scientists, right? So, so what's going on with pseudogenes? Because we often do see them being cited in response. We can make all these arguments that, okay, ENCODE shows the vast majority of the genome is functional. We've got all these different functions, 130,000 specific genetic elements for which function has been discovered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you still will get people saying, well, what about this or that? What about pseudogenes? So what are pseudogenes? So pseudogenes are stretches of DNA that look like a gene, okay? They may even look like a gene that you already have in your body, but for whatever reason, they're not capable of producing a protein, a protein, okay? They're not actually protein coding genes. Um, they may not be able to produce a transcript, or maybe the transcript that it does produce is not capable of being translated into a functional protein for whatever reason, all right? So let me say this first of all. It is possible that some pseudogenes might actually be non-functional junk. And what's going on here is just because something doesn't work today doesn't mean it was not originally designed, all right? So if you take my laptop, you go put it on the top of Mount Rainier, which is, you know, if you about 50 miles away from where I live here in Seattle. If you put a laptop on the top of Mount Rainier and you leave it there for 30 years, I guarantee you come back, it's not going to work anymore, okay? Does that mean that the laptop was not originally designed? No. It just means that even designed objects can have complex histories. They may have been originally designed, and you can see that aboriginal design reflected in the makeup of the structure. However, some natural force, you know, natural processes often tend to decay uh, functionality. So some natural process may have caused it to no longer work properly, okay? So you could have some pseudogenes which exist in the human genome, and they really are, you know, something that were originally designed to be functional. They experience mutations, and now they don't work, all right? But the argument goes like this, that you find the same pseudogenes in, in, different, in different species in the exact same locations with the same mutations that prevent them from being able to produce a protein coding gene. Okay. This then becomes an argument that says, look, no designer would put the same genes into the same locations in a genome that a designer would, you know, basically for it to be functionalist junk. All right. In one species, maybe, but when you see them in multiple species, the best explanation would be that some ancient ancestor experienced a mutation that rendered that gene non-functional. And now that non-functional pseudogene, as they're called, has been inherited by various daughter species or, or descendant species. And now they all have that same pseudogene. It's evidence of their common ancestry. In fact, a good example of this happened at the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial. This was a trial over the teaching of intelligent design in public schools, happened way back in 2005. Ken Miller, again, and very much an ID critic. He was a he's a Brown University biologist, very good scientist, but you know, he's very much an outspoken critic of intelligent design. So he's part of that evolution, you know, discourse going on. And he testified at the Dover trial. Actually, I was there. I watched him testify in person. I, I and here's what he said. He said that there's a particular pseudogene in the human body called the beta globin pseudogene. He said it is, quote, broken. It has a series of molecular errors that render the gene non-functional. And he said all three of these species, talking about humans, chimps, and gorillas, have matching mistakes, leading us to just one uh, conclusion, common ancestry. And then a couple of years later, in a book called Only a Theory, he said, the gorilla and chimpanzee pseudogenes have exactly the same set of molecular errors. He says, in a court of genetic copyright law, 
any motion that a designer could claim originality for the human genome would be tossed out in a flash, okay? So he's very much arguing against design on the basis of these pseudogenes. Now, Eugenie Scott has also commented on the pseudogene. She gave a lecture before the American Museum of Natural History in 2007, where she said that the beta globin pseudogene, quote, isn't going to do diddly. It's just going to sit there, not do a thing. She goes on to say the pseudogene is not going to function. It's not going to do anything because it is an inert gene. Okay, so what's interesting, Christopher, is that this pseudogene, the beta globin pseudogene, even though back in like, say, the, the mid to late 2000s, we didn't know what it did. And I would have said to people back then, okay, maybe it is really just a useless piece of junk DNA, but you don't know that. Why don't we adopt a wait and see approach and actually wait and see what science discovers? So lo and behold, in 2013, there was a paper that came out in the journal uh, Genome Bi Biology and Evolution that found that basically these pseudogene, copies of these pseudogenes in human chimp and gorilla are more similar than they ought to be if they really were functionless junk and they were just accumulating sort of random neutral mutations at a constant rate. They're more similar, showing that there's some kind of a function that is being selected for, and they're experiencing what is called purifying selection that prevents them from being able to, to accumulate random mutations. So that was in 2013. Uh, then a couple of years ago, I was actually writing about this pseudogene because um, basically the American Museum of Natural History posted on its YouTube channel, Eugenie Scott's old lecture, where she was saying this pseudogene isn't going to do diddly. And she was attacking me in this lecture by name. And so I thought, well, you know what? I want to look at, look into this and see if there's been any new discoveries about this pseudogene after they posted her lecture on the YouTube channel. They posted it, I think it was at the very end of 2021, early 2022. And what I found was there was a paper in the journal Developmental Cell, came out in early 2021, which basically found that this pseudogene is, quote, essential. It is essential for making red blood cells in human beings. And they said that it is indispensable and essential for erythropoiesis, which is basically making red blood cells, okay? So this pseudogene that leading evolution advocates, ID critics, were saying is broken, is not doing anything, is actually, turns out to be essential for creating red blood cells in human beings. This is a great example of how evolution stops science. It restricts people from investigating the function for things that they don't yet understand. And there have even been scientists that have recognized that the term junk DNA hindered scientists and basically restricted them and uh, discouraged them from studying function for junk DNA. And this pseudogene example is a great example of that. So what I would say with pseudogenes is, yes, it's very well established that they can have functions. In fact, it's well established why pseudogenes even often have to resemble protein coding genes, even though they don't produce a protein. Many pseudogenes will produce an RNA transcript. That transcript is not capable of being translated into protein, but that transcript is then capable of going out into the cell and regulating the protein coding version of that gene. So you basically have these RNA transcripts from the pseudogenes and RNA transcript from the protein coding version. They can interact in the cell and that can be a way that they can regulate the, the actual uh, usage of the, the protein coding version of the transcript. And you need those similarities between the pseudogene and the protein coding version to be there because those similarities allow those transcripts to then interact properly and allow them to actually regulate the expression of the gene. So long story short is pseudogenes can have many functions. It is, again, it's premature to conclude that they are non-functional junk because so many of them have been found to have important functions in the human body. I think this example of the uh, beta globin pseudogene is a really poignant example of what can go wrong when you assume that something is junk when it's really not. That extends even to pseudogenes. For this next question, we're going to take a look at your recent debate on junk DNA with Dr. Dan on the Non Sequitur Show. Dr. Dan argued against the idea that the endogenous retroviruses or the ERVs can be explained within the ID scientific model. He gave three reasons for his argument, which goes as follows. Will this piece of RNA from the virus hybridize, form a double helix, with this piece of RNA from your genome? And we can show, based on the biophysics of it, that the answer to that question for most endogenous retroviral sequences is no. Because, one, 
The sequence is not transcribed because the LTRs are broken down. Two, the transcribed sequence is too short to matter for the length of that complete virus. And three, the sequence has diverged from the virus by too much and it would no longer effectively hybridize with it within the cell. So Dr. Luskin, is Dr. Dan correct or do ERVs fit within the design model? So Dr. Dan, his name is Daniel Stern Cardinale. He is an evolutionary biologist at Rutgers University. And he and I had a debate on uh, the non sequitur show, which is sort of a skeptic show uh, back in May of 2024 about whether or not the genome is largely functional junk. And I first want to say something complimentary about Dr. Dan. During the, the, the debate, he was very cordial, very civil. He showed a very great depth of knowledge on the topic. And I really appreciate his willingness to, to have the conversation. Nonetheless, despite that, during the debate, Dr. Dan really, I think, exemplified the kind of exact reasoning that we're talking about here, that what evolutionary biologists tend to do is they tend to assume that if we don't understand what something is doing, that therefore it is functionless junk and is doing nothing for you and is evidence for sort of some, you know, random garbage accumulating in the evolutionary past. All right. And Dr. Dan exemplified this kind of reasoning over and over and over again in our debate. I even predicted, when talking talk about predictions, I predicted the, at the beginning of the debate that we would see that Dr. Dan was going to show us how evolutionary reasoning basically hinders and discourages people from studying, studying whether or not the junk is functional because they just assume that it can't do anything because they don't, they don't, they can't envision what it might do. So they assume it's junk. And the argument that you just described here that basically we have certain um, repetitive DNA, he's talking about ERVs, which are so short that they can't be transcribed um, or, you know, they can't actually perform the function that they would normally perform because they're broken down. He said that they are, quote unquote, degraded. All right. And so the idea is, well, what does it what, in, in sort of if it's a, actually a virus, what does an endogenous retrovirus do? Well, it will produce certain proteins, certain enzymes. Those enzymes then allow uh, the it to form this retrovirus, which can then basically go out into your genome and retrotranspose and reinsert the viral DNA back in, into another part in your genome. Okay, in Dr. Dan's mind, if an ERV isn't doing that function, then there's no other function it can do. All right, that was the way he argued that basically, if it can't produce the enzymes required for retrotransposition. That's all it does. There's nothing else it can do. The problem is that we know of numerous, numerous examples of functions for ERVs and other repetitive DNA that's associated with viruses or these retrotransposons that can be performed in our bodies that have nothing to do with retrotransposition. And that, and that actually hints in my mind at these DNA um, sequences actually not being the result of ancient viral infections. They're actually, you know, designed elements of the genome that are supposed to be there doing various important functions. And so um, they're not just the result of ancient viral DNA. Uh, they might look like viral DNA. In fact, sometimes one of the functions of ERVs is to interact with viral DNA when you have a viral infection. And it's a part of an immune response to viral infections coming from ERVs, what we call quote unquote ERVs in the human genome. But I don't know if they were actually originally viral infections. They may be designed parts of the genome that are designed to actually, you know, function in this way. But let's talk about Dr. Dan's specific challenge. Do we know, he actually talks about very short fragments of ERV, of what we think are ERVs, that are too short and that don't actually produce any RNA transcript and are too short to do anything else. The question is, do we know of functions for ERVs that fall into that category? And the answer is yes, okay? We do know of uh, pretty much any time Dr. Dan would claim that we don't have any function for this or that, he was actually wrong. And we do know function for, for you know many, many types of junk DNA. We actually put up an article on our website documenting over 50 papers that describe um, function for what for repetitive DNA that Dr. Dan claimed was too degraded to have a function, okay? But in this particular case, let's just give one example of one function, right? Enhancers. Enhancers are segments of, of the human genome that are involved in regulating the protein coding parts of the genome, okay? They're involved in regulating genes. And what's interesting about enhancers is you can have an enhancer that regulates a gene that could be very, very far away in the genome. It might even be on a different chromosome. So you could have this repetitive ERV DNA um, that is on one chromosome that is in fact regulating the expression of a gene 
totally far away on a different chromosome in the genome, all right? And enhancers can, in fact, be very short. I looked this up before our interview. You can have enhancers that are as short as 50 base pairs. And I'm sure that that's, you know, probably some of the examples of ERVs that Dr. Dan thinks are too short or even longer than that, much longer than that. So you can have ERVs functioning as enhancers that are very short, and they don't need to provide a transcript, by the way, to do this enhancer function. You can have other regulatory proteins latching onto an enhancer, which then are involved in a complex regulatory regulatory system to regulate that protein coding gene somewhere else in the genome. So enhancers can be very short, they can be part of repetitive DNA, uh, like ERVs, and they don't have to produce a transcript and they can have functions involved in regulating gene expression. So, you know, exactly what he said cannot exist, does in fact exist. And I don't know what else to say. I mean, he would make this kind of argument over and over and over again. And he would say that, you know, this type of DNA can't be functional. This type of uh, DNA can't be functional. And we would then come up with examples of no, actually, it can be functional. So let's just not keep making this evolutionary argument that assumes that if you don't know what it's doing, that therefore it must be junk. It's very dangerous. So just to give some other examples of what Dr. Dan called repetitive DNA that cannot be functional because it's too degraded. We went through the literature. We found they can be involved in DNA methylation. They can be involved in transcriptional interference through, uh, through molecular rheostats. They can be involved in, in regulating, regulating chromatin um, and heterochromatin inducers. They can carry antisense promoters. They can be involved in, as enhancers in embryonic stem cells. Uh, they can be involved in regulating um, assist regulatory determinants in embryogenesis and later. They can be involved in tissue-specific cis, cis regulatory sequences. They can be involved in RNA processing. They can be involved in sort of T-cell quiescence, which is involved in regulating um, invol uh, cells involved in the immune system. They can help build the nuclear matrix or scaffolding. Um, they can be a form of code around euchromatin regions. Uh, they can be involved in cell differentiation. They can be involved in inactivating certain uh, uh, X chromosomes in, in females, and they can help uh, regulate the three-dimensional organization of the genome and the nucleus. So there, these are just some of the functions. There's other functions as well that these quote-unquote degraded repetitive DNA elements can have. Uh, exactly what Dr. Dan says cannot exist, can exist. So I think it's just, again, a, a good lesson to learn as soon as you start to think that a particular stretch of DNA cannot be functional, there's a good chance that you're going to find that it, it can, in fact, be functional, and it doesn't have to necessarily be junk. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Luskin. Many skeptics will sometimes claim that intelligent design is the science stopper. However, as you pointed out, ID was right on the issue of junk DNA, since scientists were predicting it from the foundation, at least in the 1990s. So, Dr. Luskin, with this context, can you answer whether or not the scientific theory of intelligent design is a positive model? So, yeah, it, it is a positive model. ID makes positive predictions that are testable. Junk DNA is a great example of this. ID theorists predicted, based upon the theory of ID, you know, long before we knew about function for junk DNA back in the 90s and, and later, that we would find function for junk DNA. But this raises the question, why? Why does intelligent design predict function for junk DNA? Is this just an arbitrary thing or is there a good reason for it? I think there's a very good reason for it. It's very simple. When intelligent agents design things, they can tend to make things for a purpose or for a function, okay? When you put a bunch of ingredients in a bowl and mix it up, you know, unless you kind of lost your mind, you are doing it for a reason. You want to bake a cake. You want to make... Um, pastry you want to you you you're, you're, you're going to make eggs or breakfast you know something like that. there's many reasons why you you put those specific ingredients in that bowl and you're mixing it up you're doing these things for a purpose or for a function in the same way if the genome is in fact designed we can make a prediction that the designer put things there for a purpose and for a function and that is what allowed us to predict the function for the junk dna okay and i want to say that back in the late 90s and early 2000s, when I was involved with this debate, I would get hit over the head with the junk DNA argument. And I would say, look, I'm going to stick my neck out here. We don't know what the junk DNA is doing, but I think that we can make this prediction that we're going to find function. And then lo and behold, as we got into the decade of the 2000s, we found more and more functions. And when, in the 2010s and the 2020s, 
the p- number of papers, I mean, it barely even makes the news anymore. There's so many papers that find function for junk DNA. So, um, so yeah, this is a positive, successful prediction of intelligent design. Dr. Luskin, we've now arrived at our final question. Can you share how interested individuals like up and coming scientists can get involved with ID work? So we have quite a few different research projects that we're uh, funding here at a Discovery Institute where I work. One of them is actually something called our Junk DNA Work Group. Uh, we, it's a group of scientists who are collaborating together to l- explore functionality for junk DNA. Some of the scientists in this work group actually already do research on junk DNA and their ID theorists who are doing that research precisely because they were inspired by their ID paradigm to look at function for junk DNA. So that is a great way, if you're interested in this topic, to get involved. Uh, they can You can contact us at Discovery Institute and some of the email will find its way to me and, and we, we can make it happen. But yeah, there there's all other quite a few other projects as well, sort of beyond the scope of this presentation to go through all that. But, but certainly if folks are interested in getting involved with ID research, they can email us and we can see if there's a way for you to get involved with one of our projects. Dr. Luskin, thank you very much for your time. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. Luskin's biographical information, his lectures, scientific papers, and more information in the description. Additionally, you'll also find the Discovery Institute's website and a link to the Christ Jesus Ministries merch store. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.